going to have a panel, and it is, let's see, where are we? What does it take to make the internet of everything real? So where is our moderator, Michelle Polino? Michelle, are you here? Okay, so we'll get Michelle up here, and I will have Michelle introduce her panelists once we're set up. And Michelle is with Forrester Research. I'm a principal analyst at Forrester Research, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I've been at Forrester looking at technology, specifically mobility and the idea of Internet of Things for the past 10 years. Anyway, thank you very much for being here. My name is Chi Man Bolin. I'm CEO and President of Paradis Partners. It's a technology-based company that works with companies to improve their valuation, either leading to the next level growth, a liquidity event, M&A, or IPO. Um, I've worked in mid-sized cap and growth companies on the product side. Um, not only in the embedded chip area, but also in the storage network and uh, software side of the house. Okay, so now uh, I'll try. Wave if you can hear me at the back there. You can, okay. So my name is uh, Janet Landers. I'm Senior Vice President of Business Technology at Starbucks. Um, so the interesting thing about Starbucks is there's this whole side of it that hopefully you all know, which is our interaction with our customers. But I actually work on technology which really supports the back-end systems. So all of the uh, supply chain, our store development, which is store design and construction, um, CPG, which is our business-to-business -business channels of uh, CPG, licensed stores and food service, as well as finance and accounting and human resources. And I've been with Starbucks about 13 years, each one wonderful and different. Thank you. Wow. That's the beginning. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, it sounds like it. So I'm Rebecca Shaw. I am in charge of strategy and marketing uh, for Xerox's high-tech communication and media industry. Um, a few years ago, our CEO, Ursula Burns, uh, decided that it was high time to transform Xerox from a printer company to a broader services organization. And an acquisition was made. I was part of that acquisition in 2010 of ACS. And now, um, really, the company is transformed. About Out of our 120,000 employees, uh, about 80,000 are in the services business. So we're trying to change the brand to be more focused on business process transformation. So I'm in charge of strategy and marketing, and uh, very excited to be part of the panel. All right, I'm usually loud, so I'm, I'm hoping all of you can hear me. Yes? No? <laughs> All right. There's a mic. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Jashree Subramanya. I work at Cisco. I'm in charge of uh, product and solutions marketing for the Internet of Things at Cisco. So I'm assuming all of you are here because you really believe in the promise of the Internet of Things, the ability to change uh, industries and lives. So if you're not, we're hoping with this panel, you know, you're going to change and really become a believer of the Internet of Things. So really glad to be part of the panel. So as the facilitator, as well as a participant in this session, um, my background from the technology perspective is I've been in the technology industry for the past 20 years, initially as a management consultant in the telecommunications industry, and now at Forrester Research as an analyst, focusing all of my research agenda and the types of discussions I have on the idea of evolution of technology, specifically regarding the Internet of Things and enterprise mobility. Um, but before we get into that important topic today, I thought it would be good to get a perspective, because we're here at a broader conference about women in technology, to get a better understanding from each of the panelists how they arrived at their career in technology, to get a sense of the, really the varied angles that everybody comes at this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I started my career, my uh, doctorate degree, and I think I'm lucky as opposed to that much visionary, was on the computer-based information systems, uh, the storage information, the analysis of information, which is big data analytics, and the protection of information, which is cybersecurity. I went on and I went through a variety of executive product management jobs. Like I said, not only embedded smart chips, but also storage network and software. I became um, vice president of electronics of another top fortune company. Uh, spent many years as IBM in executive role, and I currently work with uh, 
worked for a mobile applications company, and also for companies who are delivering products for the IoT space, as well as companies whose success is dependent on extract, extracting data uh, to serve up to their customers. So that was my path uh, to the IoT space. Um, so I would say for me, um, my career, I would call myself an accidental technologist, actually. Uh, left university with a business degree and all the confidence of I can do anything, was sure I'd be in marketing and sales, and uh, went to work for a startup company. The great thing about a startup, it was a biotech company, so it had manufacturing as well. The great thing about Starbucks, or a startup company, Susie, it's in the DNA, um, is that you get to do everything. You get to experience all parts of business. Um, the bad side was it didn't take me long to figure out I was terrible at marketing and sales and would never have a successful career in it. Um, the good thing was that I discovered a love for supply chain. Um, what I did find during the 80s was it was a time of putting in systems. In a startup company, there wasn't anything. We used to keep inventory tracked on a card. And I started deploying systems constantly. Did it in manufacturing first, went on to do it in our distribution area. Finance came to me and said, you might as well link us up as well. Moved to uh, the States about 21 years ago, started working in supply chain again in a printing and software company and started the whole systems implementation again. Finally, the head of IT said, I think you're in the wrong job. And uh, I moved to technology. Um, so I do have a love of enabling business uh, through systems. So I'm also accidental. I actually, our, our two paths are not that different. So I certainly didn't choose to you know, start a career in technology. I studied business and international relations. And I think that really what has driven me um, to here is uh, where I wanted to live. So where, whether it be uh, Paris, uh, Berlin, Barcelona, and Palo Alto, it was always choosing a place where I would want to be on the weekends. And I uh, chose this place. Uh, we both, my husband and I both left our jobs with a toddler and came out here with no jobs and found a job 18 years ago. Uh, and we both had background in finance and marketing. And honestly, over these last 18 years, it's really interesting to see that our paths have paralleled kind of the industry where the non-techies have taken increasing roles in driving technology. Um, and I think with the Internet of Things, you're going to see more and more non-techies making critical decisions without the help of the techie. And we're going to be moving from a space where computers are helping humans to where humans are going to help computers help humans. So that's my path. <laughs> well, I have a different story. So I come from a very small town in India, and I wanted to be a doctor. And my dad was like, no way are you going to become a doctor because I can't, he couldn't find, he was telling me he couldn't find a groom who's going to be a doctor too to get me married off for the <laughs> arranged marriage, right? So I'm like, okay, what's the next best thing so I can move out of the village that I'm from? I'm like, okay, let me get into computer science. So that's how, you know, after my, so I've got into computer science. I'm like, okay, now next thing, now what do I do to get out of the country? <laughs> so my parents were very supportive, so I said, okay, I'll, I got my degree in computer science in India, and my dad was like, okay, now it's done, come back and work in the factory, you know, work, you know, set up the factory, you can go, and it was, you know, the town that I'm from, it's a textile zone. So they're like, okay, come on, you know, build up, start working in the factory and, you know, manage the IT system. And I'm like, no, this was not going to work. So I moved out of the country and did my MBA. And um, I've always worked in startups because I was like, okay, no, no, I'm not going back to take care of my family business. My brother's there. So I'm like, okay. I started getting into um, the IT side of it and started looking. I realized I was not going to be doing the coding. So I said, I'm going to do more of biz dev and marketing. So I was working in a lot of IT startups starting from Boston and I moved to this area about 12 years ago. 
And I was always in the wireless side of it, given my background in the Wi-Fi side of it, Wi-Max side of it, always in small startups, you know, based on the area. And four years ago, I joined Cisco to launch their outdoor wireless products, and that's how I got in. And about a year and a half ago, you know, opportunities, you know, I always look at it as a way as, you know, when the opportunity just comes, just grab it. It may work, it may not work, but give it a chance. So, so that's how I got into Internet of Things at Cisco and sort of led the entire Internet of Things World Forum at Cisco. I big thought leadership program that we run globally. And it's been successful for the past two years, and that's how I landed up getting into the Internet of Things. Great. I need to do that. <laughs> Give up on this. OK, so now that you have a better background on all of the panelists up here and how they entered the technology space, I wanted to really dive into this idea of the Internet of Things. And as an analyst, one of the things that's uh, very clear is that there's not a standard definition of what the Internet of Things is, what's part of that. If you talk to various different vendors, service providers, even end users, they each look at it from various different perspectives. So I thought we would start out with each panelist talking about what they see as what is the definition of the Internet of Things? What parts of technology are, are providing those types of solutions? You know, for me, as I look at the Internet of Things, um, and if I were to simplify it to two things, it would be along the lines of um, connectivity and automation. We're talking about connectivity of devices, systems, and services. We're talking about an Internet of Things, if done right, for the products that we market, sell, and develop. It's an ability without necessarily using IT for us to be in charge, for an opportunity for to what I would call the democratization of data so that we are empowered. And so that if we need information in regards to anything that we might want to do, behind the scenes, all the technology, user interfaces and everything like that, are so well positioned and integrated that we as an end user, as a consumer, can just click a button and seamlessly all these different sensories, all these different real-time analytics points can come in and can present to me as a consumer and help me make some rich decisions or some decisions that I might not have otherwise thought of. That's what, in essence, when I think of the Internet of Things, is automation and connectivity. So uh, I would ag agree with that. I think that it is um, a way to uniquely identify each device and each sensor and really allow device to communicate with device and uh, devices to communicate with human beings and really to, to uh, transfer or integrate data and uh, improve processes at the end of the day. So I agree with the first two. Um, I would say, and with the way we define it, there, it's interesting, right, that everybody can define it slightly differently. Uh, there are really three pillars <clears throat> that are kind of underpinning the internet of everything. So one is the devices, the devices that connect to each other, that connect to humans, and that provide information back to the environment. Uh, I'll, I'll let Jay Shri give the numbers of connected devices because it's Cisco's probably at the forefront of kind of sizing that market. Uh, the second is a really smart and secure infrastructure uh, in order to make that happen. And, and today, the infrastructure is already struggling to handle the internet of today. But if you imagine the numbers of devices that are going to be connected tomorrow, we're going to need the infrastructure to be much more flexible and much more secure. Uh, so one of the areas we're working on um, at Park, right up the street in Palo Alto, is a content-centric networking um, uh, standard that will you know, help address the, um, the data at the content level, by naming it at the content level. So first, the devices, second, the infrastructure, and third is the insights from the data. And big data is a really big buzzword, but it only becomes reality when you are able to turn this data into insight. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, it's just not about things. The Internet of Things, the way we look at it, Cisco, is about the Internet of Everything. It's about data, process, people, 
and then things. So it's just not about connecting senses. There's so much of value that can be brought together by just connecting the things. So at Cisco, we look at it as the, most, the biggest opportunity is in the, ad, the data and the analytics aspect of it and the applications that can bring you know, the opportunities. So um, you know, we've done a lot of surveys, and as Rebecca, Rebecca mentioned, in terms of just devices, we look at it as 50 billion devices by 2020 are going to be connected. And um, there's so much going on in terms of IoTs here, it's now. And there's so many industries around the world deploying IoT right now. So that's how we look at the Internet of Things. It's about the intelligent connectivity of devices that can, that can enable business processes and business outcomes. All right, this one seems to work. Jay Shri mentioned something that's really important, that there is an industry perspective here in terms of opportunities. Um, so oftentimes the idea of the Internet of Things is this broad concept, but I'd like to talk to the panelists and ask them a little bit more about where the opportunities are with respect to industry opportunities or even horizontal opportunities in terms of where the momentum is today. So Jay Shri, do you want to start from that perspective? We like moving mics from here to here. So there's so many opportunities um, you know, from industries. The biggest investments are going on in manufacturing, in transportation, public sector and the city side of it, um, and also public safety. Smart cities is a huge uh, you know, element there. So you know, just as before I get into manufacturing and just smart cities as an example, there's so many creative opportunities there. For example, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, from the environment standpoint, Way back, even before we all talk about the Internet of Things, what was happening was the, the Great Barrier Reef, a group out there, was uh, using sensors and using it, or connecting it to floaters, and they were creating a network in certain areas of the Great Barrier Reef. And why they were doing it was they really wanted to look at collecting the chemical data, the physical data, and biodiversity, and they were passing that information using sensors to using you know, wireless technology, satellites, microwaves, or 3G to the base station. And they started tracking you know, the movement of fish and the bio, you know, and they were looking at how to save the reefs itself. So that is just internet of things, again, connecting and looking at what can be done. There's so many examples in the healthcare. And manufacturing, it's huge because we've got a lot of examples in manufacturing. Harley Davidson, of course, everyone wants a bike right here. So, um, Harley Davidson was looking at how do they improve the product life cycles because Harley Davidson, as you know, it's personalized. Every bike is a personalized bike. So they wanted to reduce the customer response time from months to weeks to days. So they started looking at, you know, connecting the entire assembly line so every single worker could understand what the troubleshooting issues were and where the parts were in the supply chain, what the analytics was. And then they started looking at changing the factory setup with digital screens where everyone could look at what the information was. That is, again, the Internet of Things in terms of asset management, all the different IoT initiatives that's going on. So that's one example in manufacturing. And I'll let others talk, and I'll come back to some city examples. Okay. So I'll give you two examples that we're working on. So one is in healthcare. Um, we, are, we, we first we started working on remote vitals. So being able to get the vitals from a person without touching them. Uh, really critical, for instance, with uh, preemies, uh, where you do not want to manipulate them. So being able, to, using infrared cameras to be able to tell their blood pressure, the oxygen levels, etc. And then we realized that, you know, you had, in order to scale, you had to start taking this ability to provide health care by bringing the doctors to the patients. And so we made an investment in HealthSpot. Uh, HealthSpot is a startup in the, um, in the healthcare space that has built this, these kiosks that go into a pharmacy. And in the pharmacy, you can go into a very enclosed space and have a um, remote expert, a doctor uh, from Cleveland Clinic um, or you know, on other networks, 
to talk to via video conference, and also devices in the kiosk that will help take your vitals uh, from to detect an ear infection. Uh, work it, we're working on strep throat detection, et cetera. And all of this is taking place in the pharmacy, which is where the patient's going to end up in, at the end of the visit anyway to go get their, their drug. So this is a way to bring the patient to the, um, to the, uh, the doctor to the patient. And a completely different example is in um, uh, consumer goods. So we're working on a very low cost sensor label which is a printed label. You know, we, our legacy is in printing, so we have these invisible inks, and we're able to produce very, very low cost, a couple of cents, sensors that you could put on, say, a bag of salad uh, to be able to detect whether uh, in the environment the um, temperature, uh, the, um, uh, let's say, the timing of the salad, the salad is still fresh. So this is just one example, but through these very low-cost printed electronics, it can apply to a much more massive amount of um, objects in the consumer goods space. Um, from a supply chain perspective, I think if you think about the length of a, or the potential length of a supply chain, as products move from a manufacturer through a supplier to a distributor before it eventually gets into the hands of the end consumer, um, just having visibility to where is that product, what conditions is it being stored on. Um, as Rebecca talked about the temperature, if you have a temperature controlled environment, a container, how do you know that that container has stayed safe from the product's point of view throughout the whole um, transition of, or transit of that product? Um, the other part of it is just being able to sense if it's, um, if it's being trucked, if you're trucking goods uh, along the uh, interstate. On again. Can you see that there are problems further up? Are there weather conditions, traffic jams? So is there a way to, in the moment, reroute, um, reroute a truck to avoid all of that? Um, the other part of it is that if you're uh, importing containers that have to go through customs and excise, uh, when that container leaves a port somewhere else or when it is sealed, how do you know it remains sealed? How do you know the product is still intact and that nothing else has got inside that container? So all of this has been going on uh, for a few years now in supply chain to give supply chain visibility, improve quality, and avoid tampering. You know, Janet, that's a very good point. When you said it's, um, it's come about, it's been around. Um, as I listen to these various uh, sessions and everything I, like that, everybody gets re really excited about the Internet of Things as if it just birthed immediately right now in front of us. But if you look at it, and particularly in the industrial sector and in the regulated industries such as energy and healthcare, it's actually been around for some time. Elements of it have been around. Certainly not the sophistication it is now or the sophistication that it can be, but we've seen elements along it along the way. I think um, as far as in process control, we've seen it in early warning systems. In energy, we've seen some facsimile, uh, some aspects of it, and um, in smart metering, uh, remote monitoring for reduced threats, and also supply chain logistics. So what we have done is taken some of the architectures and some of the technologies and some of the big data analytics, the volume, velocity, and variety of data, and integrated this all into a set of value proposition for which IoT is one of the uh, solutions and we talked about some of the industries, but instead of looking just at an industry vertical, um, one of the horizontal applications that has really embraced it is the marketing aspects of it, be it retail and et cetera. So what the Internet of Things, if properly executed, what it will do is reveal some of the opaqueness uh, that previously we did not have access to. It will give access to some CRM data. It will get access to some of the social media data points. And so the IoT benefits not only the um, industry verticals that uh, my panelists have talked about, but it also has a lot of great benefits across these industries from a marketing function as an example. 
So that's a really interesting point because one of the things that I've been hearing up here is industry, marketing, horizontal opportunities, and not so much IT. So I'm curious because one of the things that often comes up is who's driving these purchasing uh, processes for IoT solutions? Oftentimes, as an analyst, I talk to folks in many different roles. It's not necessarily the technology um, expert in the organization doing that. It's oftentimes many line of business professionals in the field service, the customer service, in the drivers of the new, new technology development, the R&D folks. So I'm curious, um, from the perspective here, I know, who are the decision makers that are driving the opportunities today? So yeah, I'll take that. So just like Michelle, you were mentioning, when it comes to the Internet of Things, it's all about killer applications, right? Figuring out what are the different use cases from industry to industry, and it's not all going to be IT decision makers. They're really going to be called line of business buyers, and we call them operational technologists, so OTs. So where the OT, where the line of business buyers are looking at what are the business cases, what are the use cases that they should be looking at. For example, in the smart city side of it, government officials are looking at how can they reduce traffic in cities. And in addition to that, you know, how do they make revenue? Just parking itself, right? And because we could look at, there are different ways right now where even in San Francisco, there is the parking lots where there are sensors in every single parking lots and it's connected to mobile devices. And before you get to the parking lot itself, you'll know whether which space is available. Second floor, you know, lot number 25 is available because the census tells me so. And you know, what San Francisco is doing is they're creating dynamic pricing. So they're looking at increased revenue for the city itself. So who's the decision maker here? It's really the line of business buyers. And they're, of course, working with the IT. So it's the convergence of the OT and the IT side of it. And this is the same you know, across different industries on the manufacturing side of it, retail side of it, hospitality, when they look at you know, MGM and in Vegas, for example, the marketing folks are the ones looking at what is the experience that they want to you know, put together for their customers and their attendees. And then they're going and talking to the IT side of it to look at the enablement aspect. So IT becomes a foundation where they're looking at how, what's the business value that can be created, low, lowering operational business costs, making quali quality of the product even better, and, you know, and improving efficiencies. So we really look at, when it comes to IoT, we look at OT buyers and IT buyers. I think that's a really important piece of this. So for the Internet of Things, one of the things that's really important as you start thinking about opportunities that are out there to deploy these solutions, it's about getting IT and OT to, to talk together, to understand what the requirements are together. And that's not necessarily a given. In the past, many of those initiatives have happened in silos. So that's really a transformation that's happening as a result of these IoT types of solutions. Um, the other question I wanted to ask a little bit more about is what does this mean then as you have these solutions for the skill sets, the kinds of roles that are important in organizations to really transform and drive these opportunities? Are there new needs in some of these different areas uh, beyond what we've, we've been talking about so far? So. Um, I think that um, one of the things this is going to bring about when you think is a different way of thinking. Um, so we really have to completely rethink I.O., completely rethink every input and every output. And um, that's not as easily said than done. And, but what we do have right now, I believe, is a very unique opportunity. Because for the first time, or probably the first time ever from what I've read, we probably have four or five generations in the workforce. There are new people entering the workforce, the millennial generation, the digital natives, true digital natives probably won't start entering until about 2018, 2020. And they already think this way. They already automatically think this way because of how they've been, what they've experienced in, in their lifetime. I have a, a daughter and I'll, I'll just detour really quickly. So I learn a lot from her. She's 13. So I tell her a lot. She wants to know what I'm working on all the time. And I was talking to her about a project to really rethink how we take care of facilities management in stores and how we can make that easier on our store managers at Starbucks. And so she says, I have an idea. And she said, 
why don't, I was talking about how a store manager communicates there's a problem with something like a broken table or a broken chair. And she says, why don't you just build a portal and then every time they have a problem, they can just send it to you through the portal and you can send them a new one. <laughs> and then as she skips out of the kitchen, she says, and if you could make that purple, that'd be really cool. <laughs> And that sounds funny until I then read recently that Amazon actually just filed for a patent to have trucks that would have 3D uh, printing capabilities in the back of the truck so they could literally create your product as they move towards your home. So there is a natural thinking in youth today that if we could take that and partner it with older generations who are still in the workforce, <laughs> um, who have the business acumen and the skills and experience to bring with it. So I think part of it is really making the most of this workforce that we have and we will have over the next few years. Well, I can't beat that story, but it, it is clear that in the short term, we have a bit of a talent gap where a lot of uh, companies here in the Silicon Valley are looking for talent and specifically around data science uh, to make the most use of the data that we're gathering through all of these sensors providing the information. And there are lots of people looking for jobs. So there's, all, uh, there's, there's definitely something missing in the middle. So one opportunity would be to really get the academic institutions to start addressing this earlier on, start developing programs to address the needs of Internet of Things around data science, um, to get the corporations to start rolling out these programs to their, um, to their workforce of all generations. Uh, and then the startup environment is really, really critical uh, to start fostering these new, uh, these new jobs of the future. So certainly uh, a talent shift and, and uh, a, a challenge that will need to be addressed. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. So again, we're, still, we're not new, right? So what's happening is everyone understands there is the gap. And there are companies coming together to figure out how to start working together as an association, as an organization being pulled together. And there are different companies being you know, pulled into this um, discussion right now from Cisco. Um, there's New York Academy of Sciences and different universities looking at what are the opportunities that are needed, especially across the different industries from the manufacturing side of it, even the IT side of it, retail side of it just looking at the gaps that are there. So if you look at um, you know, the, the labor statistics, the US, US labor statistics, they're stating by 2020, there's gonna be about 1.4 million jobs available and there's gonna be a huge skill gap. And they're trying to figure out where are the gaps and what needs to be done from the university side of it and looking at what talents need to be developed within the existing skill set itself. So the opportunity is huge with, for the next few years because um, the Internet of Things, the name may change, but the opportunity will not, and it's here. And we'll, you know, we'll all live it for the next few years. And as the microphone migrates more to the right, <laughs> I will add that uh, ethnography is going to be really critical in the next couple of years. So understanding not what people say they do, but what they actually do in the work environment and understanding how the technology can help them, help us humans, um, because is a, there's a huge difference between what somebody says that they do in the, in the, on, on a daily basis and what they actually do. So we're doing a lot of investment around ethnography to better understand work patterns uh, in the workplace. Um, the back end of the Internet of Things framework is very complex. Don't be fooled by that. It's complex, but our success has to do with um, making that complexity simple so that people can use it. There are so many opportunities out there. I can only give you a set of optics from my experience and the jobs that I've had. Um, integration skills, cybersecurity skills on the technology side. On the business side, what I found out in one of the jobs I had as CMO, I found out that my actually IT spend as a business line executive running a P&L was actually larger than some of the IT departments. But what that required us in, uh, in terms of skills is to really understand the um, OPEX, the operation expenses at P&L, how to run it, and also what you may appear some basic things is what is the cost of customer acquisition? 
So there are so many different skills that are required that are not there yet. That I think uh, um, as we look at uh, career opportunities, as we make career shifts, as we figure out which of the opportunities that we want to go after, I certainly think this is a field in which you have many, many different options, but you also need to rev up and upgrade some of your skills as well. And I think that's a really interesting point because there are so many different opportunities. And one of the areas that we see a significant amount of opportunity and momentum and sort of differentiation as to what is the power of connecting all of these devices, assets through sensor-enabled technology and connecting that to the internet, it's about the analytics and insight that you get about your customers, about the processes that are connected now. So I wanted to ask about that, that piece of it, the data analytics and how important that becomes in really proving the power of investing in all these connected assets and, and processes. Um, I know, Jay, sure you have um, some perspective, but since we'll pass it down. Thank you. So we did a survey last year to look at where the investments are going when it comes to IoT. What are the IoT initiatives and where is the investment going? Number one on the list was really data and analytics. And the second one was to improve processes in the companies. And the third, and in fact last, was really IoT in terms of sensors. So people are really not spending the money on sensors because that's going to happen. And what we also realized was the price of each sensor is still expensive. So the price of the sensors need to come down drastically for this to become mass market. So it's going to be a few more years. So when it comes to the analytics side of it, it's big data. We've all been talking about big data. Cloud, we've all been talking about cloud for the past few years. But it's just not about data because if you look at it, for example, let's look at every single street light having sensors. An amount of data that comes every day, literally every day, and the amount of data that comes from morning to evening, and the traffic, and the cars that are going in and out. It's just going to be impossible to sort of track that. But it's about the analytics. What are certain activities that you want to track itself? So it's about the intelligence action that you're going to take on the data itself. So that's the analytics, the power of analytics. So companies looking at it, I remember when John Chambers was asked last year if he was going to leave, and he is going to, I mean, he's now the chairman of the company, as you know, we have a new CEO. When he was asked last year if he was going to leave and what company he would start, he stated it would be analytics because this is the starting point. We've all been talking, there are several companies there, but the pie is huge. And um, analytics, the power of analytics is amazing because that's where you can make you know, data decisions and improve the product quality or make better business decisions or innovations that can come out of analytics, the historical data. And there are so many other options, say, for example, when oil rigs, you know, looking at oil rigs, if there are sensors, there are decisions that oil rigs can make based on where the sensors are in real time. And there's data that can be sent up to the cloud, and historically, they can make some decisions at the oil rigs itself based on the climate, based on the patterns. So there are different options, and we call it fog computing, where it is analytics at the edge you know, computing at the edge. So this is where we've all been talking about cloud, now think of a different way of looking at it because with the sensors where it's closer to the, uh, you know, the things itself. And the things, it could be sensors, it could be industrial robotics, I mean, it could be anything, right? So it's just not small devices, it could be huge devices when it comes to a manufacturing setup and mining companies. There's a company called Rio Tinto based out of Australia, and they have mines from you know, around the globe. And they have autonomous vehicles. Um, so in mining, if you look at it you know, with labor, not too many people want to get into mining in certain areas. You know, they have autonomous vehicles going around and taking the ores from the land. So there's so many options out there. So analytics is going to be a huge opportunity uh, moving forward. So I'll, I'll give you one example in analytics. Um, it's really using anomaly pattern uh, recognition in order to detect um, a fraud. So we're using it in, um, we process a lot of Medicare claims uh, for large states and uh, there's uh, very often there's fraud uh, go going on. So by aggregating all the data and understanding what would be the tr typical patterns based on where the person is living and what has been their healthcare uh, track record, just you can kind of look at a graphical analysis and detect 
there's an anomaly and that allows you to start predicting whether this anomaly is going to repeat itself and anticipate going forward. That's the predictive analytics. Sim in similar ways in the call center space, so we run call centers for large companies. Well, increasingly you can start predicting why a person is calling uh, based on what they've been browsing, uh, what is their history um, of, of calls, and uh, what is the kind of their personal situation. So st that way you start anticipating their needs and you start um, you know, addressing their needs up front so they don't have to go through that lengthy IVR, giving all the details, et cetera, um, start addressing the needs up front. So those are two examples. You know, we've talked about data analytics, and the business case is clear. If you look at IoT, um, the, the ability to take all this data and have actionable insight is a very clear business case. But we have to remember a couple of other things. In addition, and I have to be fairly objective because I think all of us um, come from the technology side, but we have to look on the other side. In order for IoT to really take off, we need all this very data, uh, large amounts of data collected automatically through sensory, or we need the consumers to provide, to opt in to give us this data. And unless we give them, and we talked about it before, unless we give them a trust factor of security, we're not going to be able to do that in order to do and to realize the value of predictive analytics, et cetera. So uh, in addition to, um, I'd say, data analytics skills and data scientist skills, we need a huge amount of talent in the cybersecurity because think about it. In the IoT, as a consumer, what do you not want? Even though we give a lot of information, and most of us probably don't read the, um, the agreements when we opt into something, but what we don't want is what is private to be made public. And so those are the kind of issues in skills in addition to data scientists, data compliance experts, um, and uh, various other skills that we need in order for this really to be a robust uh, new technology and a business initiative. That's a really great point. So I think we've been talking about all the potential opportunities that we're seeing emerging for deploying these IoT solutions. But in order to get to those very large numbers of many, many billions of connected devices and assets and processes, um, I'd like to ask the panelists, what are some of the challenges that we still need to deal with or issues that still need to be addressed? And I think you hit on one, which was around security. What's going to happen to this information? How do I make sure everything remains secure that should indeed be, whether it be information captured or the actual devices and processes? But I'd be cur curious to see where some of these other opportunities to really drive the next wave are. Um, so I think... Yeah, if you were to name the top three, it's probably security, security, security. So once you get beyond the top three, um, because there is a matter of keeping the data safe and also um, can devices be hacked and can damage be done? So if you just think that um, if bad data or a, a bug gets into a system and everything's connected, that damage can be done pretty fast as well. Um, and the other, the other one is we need to be really sensitive to... Um, Actually, I don't, I don't know how to say it other than the kind of a creepy factor, right? So we, <laughs> we kind of hand over all of our information, and this data and analytics is used by companies to really create value to me as, as a consumer, as a customer. Um, but at some point, it's sort of, I know you know it, but I don't want you to tell me that you know that much about me. And so it's how can you do it um, in a very sensitive way? So I completely agree with those. Um, the ITOT convergence that Jayshree was talking about earlier is also coming with its own set of challenges because you have multiple buyers and therefore it's really hard to make decisions to drive uh, adoption of these new technologies. And I've found, as we work with many large corporations, that the lack of a single owner to drive IoT is actually stalling the adoption. So the, the multiple owners uh, would be an, an additional challenge that I think we face. The lack of standards uh, that are agreed upon across the industry uh, would certainly be another. 
I think you've covered it. From the security side of it, it's just not cybersecurity. Most importantly, now it's physical security too. I mean, that is huge, right? Because there's sensors and things everywhere tracking us also for the best of, you know, I mean, experience itself. Um, standards, architecture, there's so many. Everyone, right now what's happening is they're looking at the IT world, they're looking at what's happening in the enterprise and extending it for IoT. It works. But we got to start looking at the use cases and looking at personalizing it for IoT. So there is the standardization aspect of it. There are standards for security, privacy, compliance issues that are being discussed in different organizations right now. And there's from the architecture side of it, there's a five layer architecture, seven layer, whatever it is. If we all come together and saying, okay, this is the architecture, because there's several vendors when it comes to IoT, from the things to the applications. You know, how do you connect the two, right? And there's so many vendors and the protocols are all different. And of course, when it comes to the industrial, industrial side of it, manufacturing side of it, region to region, there are different certifications. So that adds another set of, you know, issues and challenges that come with it. So, um, you know, but most importantly, I would agree, it is security. Um, one kind of end point, because I kind of brought up cybersecurity, and, and I'm glad I did, but also I want to caution you, is we need to make sure that protection of our data does not lead to paralysis. That is the absolute worst thing I think uh, could happen. Um, if you look at it in all the uh, cybersecurity studies that I've looked at and the research we, that we've done, is that companies, when hacked, they often don't know for 18 months. How long do you think it will take before you realize it? But you know, let's put that in perspective. Let's weigh it, the, the pros and the cons. I think it outweighs, and maybe technology can keep up with this, but I, I think it absolutely outweighs the benefits of the, of the promise of IoT is there. Let's just keep everything in perspective, including cybersecurity, including the architectures, including access points, et cetera, as well. So a lot of the questions that we were diving into was around IoT, but I guess I want to bring it up a level as we, we wrap up at least the, the, the part, first part of this discussion, which is we know that there are not that many women in technology. So I'd like to ask the panelists how to really drive more opportunities for women in technology. What kind of um, perspectives can you lend to folks in the audience who want to go into this area and uh, where should they start? So I don't know whether it's particularly for people in, in the audience, but um, I think my own belief is it kind of starts a little bit in the education system. And uh, if I think about, and these are all going to be generalizations, but if I think about boys, they have an innate sense of curiosity, a wonderful sense of curiosity. And they want to know how things work and how can they be taken apart? How can it be put back together again? And our education system is really geared around that. Um, it's the kind of a project of the day or an exercise of the day. But I think um, in girls, it's a little bit different. They kind of grow up wanting to know, it's only relevant if I can do something with it. How can I make the world better? How can I make a difference to humanity? And we don't kind of teach to that side of it. So I think if we're really serious about moving um, to having more women in technology, it needs to start a lot, a lot earlier. Wow, that's a really big topic, and I know that you guys have been thinking about for for a long time. Um, so I, I happen to work in a company where you know the CEO is a woman, and the CFO is a woman, and the CTO is a woman, and it's uh, certainly uh, from a corporate standpoint having very strong messaging from the top uh, certainly matters. Um, you know, all the way down to the youngest uh, generations in the workforce. Um, but, um, you know, from a kind of a, a personal standpoint, I, I think that um, being able and being open to switch often and to go where the opportunities are going, so to follow uh, opportunity, even if it seems to be a detour, uh, certainly worked um, well uh, for a lot of women that I that I uh, that I see around me. So just following the opportunity, even if it seems to be perhaps temporarily uh, a downgrade. I would agree with Janet that it starts from the education system itself, right from middle school, middle school and high school. 
And we're really, at Cisco, we're really looking at different opportunities. And in fact, you know, just last year, we sort, of, we sort of looked at women in IoT, and we have, you know, a big working group just to look at what the different options are. And earlier, end of last year, we announced a grand challenge for young women just focused on middle school. And, you know, the challenge ended last week, and we had 1,500 girls, young girls, from around the globe who given ideas of different IoT technologies, right? from Kenya. A little girl, she was what, 14 years old, and she gave, gave, you know, submitted an idea about you know, looking at crime, you know, how, do you, you know, how do you prevent crime in a certain district in, in Kenya. It was just fantastic, and there were girls from Japan, from India, you know, several different countries coming in and talking about just IoT, and we were going to different schools to, to look at what is it that we need to do to really look at you know, giving them the confidence because when they get out of science, what we've heard is it's really only in middle school where they make the decision. Is it science or is it something else? So science and technology. So I would look at it that we need to start at home. We need to start at home with our daughters, with our nieces, with our neighbors, and start at home and, you know, give them the confidence that anything is possible. Show them ideas, you know, with everyone has, you know, access to iPads right now. Girls, boys, yes, you know, the, the types of games that they play is different, but I think uh, we need to build up that confidence, show them that anything is possible. So I'm hoping that you all have some questions. I think we, we have plenty, and we could still stay up here for quite some time. So I'd like to open it up for just a couple questions from the audience, and certainly we'll be here after as well. But uh, if there are any questions, let's, uh, let's have one or two. <laughs> Is that one on? Oh, good. Michelle Ladenley, I'm from Qualcomm. I've been in the industry about 20 years. Um, I survived, so I think most people in this room have survived, so a hand for us for that. <laughs> Um, I want to address a point you made earlier about just security and level of trust. So I, I'm going to take you back a minute. So I just installed a home control unit in my house. I, I did an S thermostat and I'm in this process of doing all the, uh, the CO2 detectors. And as a mom and a wife, I am the IT expert in my house. I'm trying to do all this stuff to try to figure out how to get information for me that makes sense for my house and for sort of the way I live my life. And part of when I'm doing that, part of what I'm thinking about is what is the security aspect of that? And how do I manage that to make sure that uh, I'm not putting myself or my family at risk? Um, but you know what's really interesting to me is I talked to my son, who's 21, about this, and his level of the type of information that he's willing to give up to get something back is yeah. very different than mine. How do we address that moving forward? Because I think the type of consumers that we have moving forward, that generation, and what they're willing to give in terms of their own information and their own level of security is very different than my generation. How do we deal with that with IOE? And I, think, I actually think it's an opportunity, but I think we do have to be careful about it. What's your response to that? I'm from a marketing, hi, how are you doing, Michelle? I'm good, thank you. Um, from a marketing perspective, we actually pay a lot of attention to the millennials and different generations. I think the balance is between security and privacy. And I think that's one, it has to be up to the individual. How much are they willing to give for what they will receive? So that's some of the considerations that uh, you might want to be thinking about because it's not only the smart home, it's how much trust you put in, for example, other aspects of it. We're putting a lot of micro drives in, one of the companies I work with, we're putting a lot of micro drives into the intelligence of companies, leading to, for example, a, um, a driverless car or to uh, let cars talk to each other, prevent crashes and et cetera. So that's something from a cultural fit um, and uh, values we need to think through. So it's a very good question that I think all the marketeers are battling as well as the development side. 
Actually, what I was going to say is just recently I did read about this. And, um, but the general thinking in the article I read was that today's millennials, you're right, they give, up, they give out a lot more than any of us would be comfortable with, but that the digital natives or the next generation that isn't yet named, those born from 2000 onwards, are not as open about it because they have um, actually lived through a lot more experience. They're not as trusting of companies because of the big crash. They're not as trusting of governments because of everything that we've seen in wartime. They're, not as, um, they're just not as trusting. They've lived in a different era. So actually the article was saying we just don't know if uh, people being open will continue or if it will be kind of moderate itself over time. So I don't really have an answer for you other than, than that. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um there's two, two things. One is uh, the driverless car is already a lot safer than, the, than driven by a human. Um, uh, and the other is that um, uh, you have, I forgot what my other one is, but it will come back in a second. <laughs> um, I think it's a time, right? I look at it and saying, yes, your son is ready to give up more, but he's also going to get more. And it's a comfort level. And I don't think we should push ourselves. You know, I think we should just look at, you know, from what you're doing at home, you're looking at, yes, you're putting your Nest thermostat there. You're looking at, you know, all the different home, smart home devices. I, th I would look at it as a way to focus on what value you're getting out of it. And that's it. Because there are things that we can't control. Because I've heard news about, yes, Google's put that in. It can track when I'm at home, when I'm not at home, and if I've switched it off. And there's so many other possibilities, but let's wait and watch what's coming up. So I would really look at it and saying every single industry, as you're thinking about it, your industry and you know, the home side of it, look at what the user applications are. You know, what is the killer app that you want to focus on and build it up? And yes, it may work in terms of privacy. There are certain things that you may have to give up, but it's all the comfort level that you're ready to set. Thank you. Thank goodness that microphone is passing back and allows me to remember what I wanted to say. So just uh, making sure that we're building empathy into the machine uh, before it gets smarter. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for bearing with us. Absolutely, I would love to thank my panelists here. We had, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I learned a lot as well. So please um, join me in thanking everybody up on the here.